Okay. Well, welcome everybody um, to the uh, Graduate School's Professional Development Series. Uh, I'm Todd Leff, Associate Dean at the Graduate School, and I'm going to be the moderator today. Um, our speaker is uh, Emily Grecken, who's Associate Professor of Psychology and is uh, is going to be giving the presentation. My job here is going to be to monitor the chat. Um, we have enough people here that it's going to be a little awkward to interrupt during the presentation. Um, but if you have a question that pops up and you want to make sure it gets answered, put it in the chat. I'll try to monitor the chat as we go along. If it's something that I think should be um, uh, discussed or addressed immediately, I'll interrupt uh, uh, Dr. Grecken. Um, so a few other notes. Uh, as, as, you, as you saw, this is going to be recorded. It is being recorded. It will be posted tomorrow on the grad school website. So if you, if you um, are a speaker at the symposium coming up and there's some stuff you want to review and look at again, you'll have a chance to do that uh, tomorrow. Um, also, for those of you um, who will be speaking either posters or a platform presentation at the symposium uh, in March, um, tomorrow we'll be posting a checklist for all speakers. Um, so be on the lookout for that. That'll have more information about what is expected of you and some, some guidance about how to manage the, the, the presentation. Um, the, and, and today's presentation is relevant to both. It, it's centered on a 10-minute talk, um, but it is relevant to both poster presenters and uh, platform presenters. And really, in, in a lot of ways, in this virtual environment that we're holding the symposium, and there's not a huge amount of difference between a poster presentation and um, and sort of the classic 10-minute platform presentation. Um, for those of you who are speaking, either posters or platform talks, we're going to have um, uh, optional dry runs where you can log on. One of us from the graduate school will be there. You can test out your slides, make sure you can share your screen appropriately and all that. It's, um, it, it's kind of a nice thing to do just to, to get some of the technical stuff out of the way and um, reduce the number of things you have to think about um, when it comes time for your presentation. So uh, that's all I have to say. Um, let's get started. Um, so uh, Emily, uh, take it away. All right, will do. Thank you, Dr. Luff, and welcome, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here on this very windy February day. Um, I hope you guys are all somewhere nice and, and warm and, and inside at this point. Um, but um, as Dr. Luff said, my name is Emily Grecken, and I'm a faculty member in the psychology department here at Wayne State. Um, I'm also a substance use researcher, and some of the examples I'll use today will reflect that. So just a heads up. Um, but today I'm going to give a brief presentation about how to give a brief presentation. And more specifically, I'm going to talk about how to present your research in 10 minutes or less, which is something that I know many of you will be doing at the upcoming graduate symposium. And I just wanna start by acknowledging that presenting your research in 10 minutes or less is really, really hard. And it's hard because your research is complicated and technical and nuanced and messy and really hard to explain to people outside of your field. That said, presenting your research succinctly is also a very important skill because most of the time you're asked to talk about your research, you are asked to do so quickly. So you might be given 10 minutes to present your research at a conference, or you might have seven pages to describe your research in a grant application, or you might have two minutes to talk about your research in a job interview. So knowing how to present the gist of your research in a way that's succinct but also meaningful is a really important skill. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. 
Before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that I drew some of the material for my talk today from a presentation given by the Klein program at Northwestern University. Um, and I posted a link to that presentation here on the slide. I think um, someone's gonna send these slides to you after I'm done today. So you guys are welcome to take a look at the entire presentation if you want. Um, and I also just wanna take a minute to thank my former graduate student, Marina Fodor, and my current graduate student, Michael Schmidt, um, because I'm using some of the slides they created for their research presentations as examples in my talk today. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's dive right in. Um, I wanna start today by talking about how to structure the introduction to your talk. And then a little later, I'll switch gears and talk about how to present your methods and your results and your conclusions. Okay, but let's start with the introduction. Most effective introductions follow a basic pattern. Okay? First, you give some background information about your research topic. Then you identify a complication with the research literature. Then you describe your specific research question and how it addresses the complication. And then finally, you state your hypotheses or what you think might happen in your study. Right. So let's break this down a little bit more, starting with the background. In the background section of your introduction, you want to spend a minute or two presenting what's already known about your research topic, okay? So here you're going to present information that's already understood and widely accepted. So for example, suppose that you're giving a talk on schizophrenia. You might start your talk by saying, 3.2 million people in the United States meet criteria for schizophrenia. That's background information. It's information that's already known and widely accepted. Or suppose you're giving a talk on mindfulness-based interventions for smoking cessation. You might start your talk by saying, mindfulness-based interventions are effective in reducing cigarette smoking. Again, that's background information, information that we already know, that we already accept, okay? Next, we're gonna move on to the complication. The complication is something that makes the research literature messier, muddier, harder to understand or interpret. Okay. So the complication could be a gap in the research literature, something we don't yet know. It could be a problem with the methodology of existing studies. It could be a particular population of people that hasn't been studied yet. Again, it's something that complicates the research literature that makes it messier or harder to understand. So let's go back to our talk on schizophrenia. Again, we might start this talk with some background information. So we might start by saying 3.2 million people in the United States meet criteria for schizophrenia. And then we present our complication. So we might say, however, no studies have examined the prevalence of schizophrenia among LGBTQ adults, okay? So here our complication is a group of people who haven't yet been studied. Or going back to our smoking cessation example, we might start with our background information. Mindfulness-based interventions have been affected in reducing cigarette smoking. And then we present our complication. However, these interventions are time-consuming, and inaccessible to the vast majority of smokers, right? So here our complication is a problem with existing research methodology, okay? After we talk about our complication, we want to identify our specific research question and how it addresses the complication. So in our schizophrenia example, we start with our background information, 3.2 million people in the US meet criteria for schizophrenia. Then we present our complication. No studies have examined the prevalence of schizophrenia among LGBTQ adults. And then we present our specific research question 
and how it addresses the complication. So we might say, in the current study, I address this gap in the literature by examining rates of schizophrenia among LGBTQ adults in a nationally representative sample, okay? Here's our smoking cessation example. Again, we start with our background information. Mindfulness-based interventions have been effective in reducing cigarette smoking. We present our complication. However, these interventions are time-consuming and inaccessible to the vast majority of smokers. And then we present our specific research question and how it addresses the complication. In the current study, we address this issue by developing a single session mindfulness-based intervention for smoking cessation, okay? And then finally, um, we end by presenting our hypotheses or what we think will happen when we test our research questions. Okay. So in our schizophrenia study, our hypothesis might be that rates of schizophrenia will be lower among LGBTQ adults than among adults who don't identify as LGBTQ. Okay. In our smoking cessation study, we might end by saying, I hypothesize that the single session mindfulness intervention will be as effective as a standard multi-session intervention in reducing smoking, right? So does everybody understand this basic structure, background, complication, question, hypotheses? Any questions about that structure at this point? All right. In a 10 minute presentation, you wanna spend two to three minutes on your introduction. And that means that you're going to need to trim down your often very complicated project into just a few bullet points. So let me give you a slightly more fleshed out example of this. I'm gonna show you some slides that were drawn from a dissertation presentation given by one of my former graduate students, Marina Fodor. And Marina's dissertation examined the simultaneous use of alcohol and prescription opioid medications. So we know that lots and lots of people use prescription opioids, drugs like Vicodin and Oxycontin and Cody. We also know that it's dangerous to combine prescription opioids with alcohol. That said, very few studies have examined the combined use or the simultaneous use of alcohol and prescription opioids. And that's what Marina wanted to look at in her dissertation. Okay. So Marina started her introduction with some background information. And in her background section, she wanted to establish that Lots of people misuse prescription opioids and lots of people combine opioids with alcohol. So she starts her background section by saying, opioid use is very common. Um, 9.5 million American adults report past year opioid misuse. In addition, nearly 130 Americans die every day from opioid overdoses. She then goes on to say, many opioid overdose deaths involve alcohol. In fact, alcohol has been implicated in nearly 20% of emergency room visits involving prescription opioid abuse, and in 22.1% of prescription opioid related deaths. Then she says, we also know that the vast majority of prescription opioid users report past year alcohol use. All right, so that's her background section. She's established that opioid misuse is pretty common. She's given some facts that are already known and widely accepted. Then Marina moves on and presents her complication. So specifically, she says, even though alcohol is often involved in opioid-related deaths, very few studies have systematically examined the combined use of alcohol and opioids. In addition, the few studies that have examined combined alcohol and opioid use generally ask participants whether they've used both substances over a certain period of time. So for example, over the past year, 
but they don't ask whether people have used those substances together or at the same time. Finally, no research has examined predictors of simultaneous alcohol and prescription opioid use. So at this point, we don't know who's most likely to combine their prescription opioid medications with alcohol. All right, so that's Marina's complication. She's established that there are some gaps in the literature. Then she moves on and presents her specific research question and how it addresses the complication. So she says, um, in my study, I address these gaps in the literature by examining associations between simultaneous alcohol and prescription opioid use and three categories of potential predictors, borderline and antisocial personality disorders, the personality traits of conscientiousness, agreeableness, and neuroticism, and executive functioning, especially disinhibility or disinhibition and cognitive flexibility. All right, so that's her specific research question. And then she ends her introduction by presenting her hypotheses. So she says, um, I hypothesize that the likelihood of same day alcohol prescription opioid use will be predicted by a higher number of borderline and antisocial personality disorder symptoms by higher levels of neuroticism, lower levels of agreeableness, and lower levels of conscientiousness, and by lower inhibition and cognitive flexibility, okay? So that's Marina's introduction. That whole thing took maybe three minutes, two to three minutes to present and followed that same basic structure that I outlined at the beginning of the talk. Background, complication, research question, hypotheses. Okay, questions, comments so far? No, nothing in the chat so far. All right, okay, sounds good. All right, so we've talked about how to present the introduction to your talk. Let's move on now and talk about how to present your methods. In a 10 minute talk, I would recommend that you limit your method section to one or two slides. That's not always possible, but often it is. When you make your method slides, it's often helpful to organize each component of your method section under a short heading or category. So here's an example. You can see that I have three headings on this method slide participants, measures, and procedures. And next to each heading, I give relevant details. So if I were to present this method slide, I might say something like this. The participants in my study were 150 adults recruited through Amazon's Mechanical Turk. In order to be eligible for the study, participants had to report using both alcohol and prescription opioid medications more than two times per month. The measures I used in my study were the big five personality trait inventory to assess neuroticism, agreeableness, and conscientiousness, the DSM screening measure to assess symptoms of borderline and antisocial personality disorders, and three executive functioning measures, the trail making test, the Stroop color word test, and the Wisconsin card sort test. After providing consent, all of my participants completed a timeline follow-back interview to assess past 60-day alcohol and prescription opioid use. And this is an interview in which participants are given a, cal a calendar and various memory aids to help them remember whether or not they used alcohol and opioids each day for the past 60 days. After completing that interview, my participants completed the measures of personality traits and personality disorders I mentioned a minute ago. And then finally, they completed the three executive functioning tasks before being paid and debriefed. Okay, so that's how I would present it. That took about a method, uh, about a minute, and this, the method section was limited to a single slide. All right. Now, it can be really hard to describe the method section of your project using just a few bullet points. So lots of you guys are doing really, really complicated work. 
that involves multiple measures, multiple conditions, technical lab work, et cetera. And breaking that down can be very tough. One thing that helps is to ask yourself the following set of questions. So first, who is your audience? Will you be talking to experts in your field that understand the technical details of your research? Will you be talking to high school students? Will you be talking to academics attending a research symposium like the one that graduate school will be putting on? You want to tailor your talk to the type of audience that you have. For your method section in particular, it's important to ask what your audience does and does not need to know, okay? So if you're giving a talk to a general audience, they need to know things like who your participants are, what kind of tasks your participants engaged in. So what did they actually do when they started your study? What your different experimental conditions were? Okay, they need to know those things. Your audience probably doesn't need to know things like what were the test retest reliability and construct validity of your questionnaires, or how many participants passed your attention checks, or what information was in your debriefing script. Okay. All of that is really important information to put in your manuscript when you publish your study but you just don't have time to include all of those details in a 10 minute presentation, okay? Um, does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? Okay, all right. Um, after your methods section, you want to present your results. And in a 10 minute talk, I would recommend trying to keep your results section to three or maybe four slides. Again, the key is to keep it simple. In a 10 minute talk, you may not have time to present all of your findings. You may need to pick and choose certain important findings to present. Um, that's hard. It's painful to have findings that you don't present, but you probably won't have time to talk about everything you found if you've done a big study or a longitudinal study. Okay. Um, you should try to present your results in a way such that they map directly onto the research questions and hypotheses that you presented in your introduction. So here's an example. This is from the smoking cessation study that I talked about earlier. And if I was presenting this, reser this uh, re result slide, I might say something like, if you remember, my first hypothesis was that participants in the mindfulness intervention group would smoke less at one month follow-up than control group participants. And you can see that I found that smoking rates decreased over the course of the study for both groups but I didn't have any significant between group effects. So my mindfulness group participants didn't reduce their smoking more than my control group participants. All right, so you can see I presented my results here in a way that they map directly onto the hypothesis that I, that I presented earlier in the talk. And then I would move on to my next hypothesis and present the results that was relevant to that second hypothesis. Okay. Um, it's also a really good idea when you give a talk to use graphs and tables when you present your results. Um, using graphs and figures can make it easier to explain your results in a way that's clear and easy for your audience to understand, especially when your finding is a little bit com complex. So here's an example. This is from that same smoking cessation study. Um, in this study, participants were asked to engage in a cue exposure exercise where they actually had to hold a pack of cigarettes, pull a cigarette out of the pack and put it in their mouth without lighting it or smoking it. And this was an exercise designed to elicit craving. Um, so this is a graph of what my student found with this exercise. And if I were presenting this graph, I would say something like this. Um, if you look at this graph, 
you'll see that craving score is on the y-axis. The line with the filled in circles is for my control group. And you can see that craving levels for my control group increased pretty dramatically from before to after the Q exposure exercise. The line with the open circle is my intervention group. And you can see that craving increased much less deeply in my intervention group. Okay, so that's a finding that's much easier for me to explain with a graph that I walk my audience through. Okay, make sense? Okay, all right. Okay, after you present your results, you want to talk about your conclusions. In a 10 minute talk, you probably should present your conclusions on a single slide. And on that slide, you want to include a clear statement of what you found and the implications of your results. If you have time, it's also nice to include a future direction slide that talks a little bit about what should be done next, what you learn from this study and what future researchers should do to build on your findings. So here's an example of what a single conclusion slide might look like. Um, if I were presenting this slide, I would say something like, um, this study demonstrates that it's feasible to deliver a brief mindfulness-based smoking intervention over the internet. We found that participants were very engaged with the instructions and found them easy to understand and useful. And overall, the study suggests that online interventions are easily accessible and easy to disseminate online. Okay, so again, that took probably 20, 25 seconds to say a single slide for my conclusions and implications. And then if I have time, I can also present a future direction slide that looks something like this. If I were presenting this slide, I might say something like, um, in the future, researchers might want to replicate our results using larger and more diverse samples. They might want to include a weightless control group. They might want to um, do things to ensure participant engagement, for example, requiring that participants use webcams so they can be monitored. And they might want to build something like repeated mindfulness practice into the intervention. All right, again, I can say that in 15 to 20 seconds. I'm just identifying clearly some future directions for this research. Okay. Another thing you might want to put in your talk is acknowledgments. If your study is funded, so if it's funded by NIH or NSF or by a foundation like Blue Cross Blue Shield or GM, you should acknowledge that in your talk. Okay? You might also want to acknowledge some people that have helped you with your research. So maybe your research advisor or um, if there are other graduate students or undergraduates who have helped you collect or analyze your data, or if you have a consultant or a statistician, it's nice to thank those people for their help during your talk. You can do acknowledgments at the very beginning of your talk if you want. So you can start your talk by saying something like, um, I want to acknowledge that this study was funded um, by a grant from NIAAA. And I also want to take a minute to thank my research advisor, Dr. Smith, as well as Jane Doe and John Doe, um, who are undergraduates at Wayne State and helped me collect my data. Or you can end your talk with acknowledgments. Before I end today, I want to acknowledge NIH, et cetera, okay? But um, you don't need to spend a lot of time on it, 10 seconds, but it's, it's important to do, especially if your study is funded. That's something that you, you should have a slide for and you should do, okay? All right, any questions so far? Are we still good? Okay. Okay, all right. Then I want to end today by just saying a word or two about presentation style. Um, it can be hard to give a talk at a conference, especially when you are one of many talks, which is something that happens at the graduate symposium. Um, I think 
especially when you're over Zoom and it's sort of hard to see people and connect with people. A lot of times when you give a talk like that, your audience is tired and they're distracted and they've been listening to talks for a long time and they're a little bit sick of it and they're starting to think about where they're gonna get their lunch. Um, and you somehow have to get their attention and, and get them excited about what you're going to say. So the question is, how do you do that? Or what kind of speakers keep you guys engaged when you go to a talk? Anybody have any ideas? Anyone want to jot anything in the chat? Let me see. Yeah, we do have a few um, yeah. questions in the chat. And sure. um, I think this would be a good time to, um, to address them. So. Oh. One of them, uh, this is from Christine, and sure. um, she asked if um, you would recommend that presentations take the full 10 minutes, or is it okay if they do not take the full amount of time? Yeah, that's a great question, Christine. I think it's great if you can leave time for questions. You know, some of it depends on the format of where you're presenting. Uh, my understanding, Dr. Leff, is that there is some time for questions built into the Graduate Research Symposium, is that correct? That's right, and and yeah. that that's the and the right answer to this is it depends yeah. on what the format of the presentation yeah. is. And um, I, my opinion is it's always a good idea to leave time for questions. And we've tried to structure the Graduate Symposium so that there will be time. We're expecting questions. We've always had questions in the past. And um, so, yes, just make sure no matter how you do it, that you would leave some time for questions. Personally, I also don't think there's any problem with giving a slightly shorter talk than what was planned. That gives more time for questions. So it just depends on your, your subject, I guess. Yeah, yep, I would agree with that for sure. Um, we have another question that, that's a good one that um, you may want to address now or later. And it's it's related to to something I, I would have asked or would ask. And um, that's sort of the relationship of um, of this talk, which is uh, based on quantitative data. Yeah. And um, how do you how do you do this if the data is if the, the study is more in a qualitative nature? And you know, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from, Emily. I'm from the basic science world, and we sort of view everything in quantitative stuff yeah. and tend to think about that. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of research, uh, good research at Wayne and uh, around the world that really doesn't involve easy to quantify things. And so, could maybe you could say a few words about that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I I appreciate that, and it's true. I'm I'm not a qualitative researcher, but um, but love hearing about qualitative research. I think a lot of the same principles apply. You know, you're still gonna want to give some background information about why you're studying what you're studying, why it's important, and you're still gonna want to spend two or three minutes on that in a ten minute talk. Um, with a qualitative study, you're still going to want to talk about your methods, and and I think a lot of times qualitative methods are more complicated than than quantitative methods. I think um, sometimes hard to understand. So you're still going to want to have a, a method slide where you go through what you did and perhaps your coding procedures. Um, you know, in terms of your results, it might differ a little bit between qualitative and quantitative research. Um, it might be harder to to and give the kind of a figure that I gave today, but I still think it's worth trying to present your results in some kind of a, a graphical or, or figure form, um, even if it looks a little bit different than, than the one I presented. Um, and I still think that you will come to a set of conclusions and implications from your work, even if they are not as quantitatively based um, as what I presented today. So I think the same structure can apply very well to a, to a qualitative talk as, as to a quantitative talk. Um, and certainly the, the presentation style, I think, can, can apply as well. But but yeah, you're right. There's a lot of sort of less quantitative research. And, and this talk, I think, just because of my own research, <laughs> was geared a little bit more to the, to the quantitative side. So I, I appreciate that question. 
Yeah, I just add to that that uh, based on um, now several years of graduate research symposia that I've attended and participated in, some of the most effective talks, the, the talks that I've seen where I actually remember for, for, for months afterwards what the message was and what, what the point of the research was, were, were very descriptive qualitative talks on, you know, like language acquisition or things that are not, not quantitative. There are no numbers involved. They're just observations and a conclusion. And I think that's another thing. And this is Dr. Grecken mentioned this. Every, no matter what it is, quantitative or qualitative, there was a question asked at the beginning and there's a conclusion at the end. And those things still allow the listener to come away with a very clear idea of what you did and why it's important. Sorry to, to horn in on that. No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Does that, and, and I hope that answers the question. I'm happy to talk more later if it doesn't. Um, let's see if we have some other... Uh, talk a bit more about the poster presentation. So I will do that. Let's let's make sure we we get all the questions asked, answered about sort of structure of talks in general first, and then I can uh, talk a little bit more about this um, the the way we've restructured the two kinds of talks at the at the graduate research symposium. Um, here's another question in the chat. My this is from Victor. My question does not appear to align with your presentation, but it is on research. Please, what is the best way? What is the best way uh, that one can read or scan through an article to be reviewed? Victor, maybe you can expand on that a little bit, um, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and um, coming online. Victor, are you there? If it's possible that um, Victor doesn't have um, a technical setup that he can um, speak. So let me, um, um, I'm not sure how to answer your question, Victor. Emily, do you have any thoughts? Um, can you read it one more time? What's the best way to scan a research article? Was that the question? Yeah. What is the best way one can read or scan through an article to be reviewed? Um, and I assume you mean to be reviewed and then presented in the, in the context of something like what we're talking about here, where maybe this would be more not a research presentation, but a journal club, but still a presentation. Um, is, that, is that along the lines of what you're thinking about, Victor? Yes, you can. Uh, you can. You can speak, Victor. You have to unmute yourself, which looks like you are. Go ahead and speak. Hello, good day to you, Prof, and my fellow colleagues. I am asking to have a clearer view of how best one can scan through an article to be reviewed in a paper, such as writing a theoretical paper. In my field, we basically go by experimental research. But as a doctoral student, I am required to write some papers for requirement of a course. So in such a course, which is just a review, to write a review of a number of journals. So how best? Do I need to read the paper from Genesis to Revelation or just to work on the abstract findings and conclusions? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question, Victor. I think it's one that a lot of us have struggled with when we're trying to you know, compile literature and, and write theoretical reviews or meta-analyses. Um, and I think it's impossible to, you know, if you've got 100 or 150 papers to read through all of them. So my suggestion is to have a really good organizational system up front. Um, I think it's great to start with abstracts and sort of sort the papers into different categories. Um, you have to do some reading, but but I think that once you sort of have a hierarchy of articles and you're able to, you know, have in your mind some main things that you want to be paying attention to, so some research questions or some themes that you're organizing your articles around, I think it's it's easier to sort of pick and choose the ones you have to focus on more and the ones you have to focus on less. 
um, and which ones you can kind of scan through to see if it aligns with or supports certain themes. Um, but that's how I start by, by sort of doing a search, by reading through abstracts and by really organizing different papers according to different hypotheses, different research questions, different themes. Um, and then I, I sort of have a more of a roadmap about how to approach that very large body of literature. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, Victor. It, it is a little peripheral to what we're talking about today, but but crucial to um, to how we do research and absorb knowledge in, in our fields. My response to your question would be it depends a huge amount on on your your starting point in terms of that field. Is it a field you're very familiar with? You know, in my own field of research, I can read a paper really quickly and just look at a couple of figures in the abstract and the title and I'm done. And in a field I'm not familiar with, I read it in detail from beginning to end to try to absorb everything. So that's another consideration um, for that. Okay, we have another question. Um, is there a format that works best for the platform we are presenting for the GRS um, symposium? PowerPoint slide, Google Slides, right. I don't know what Prezi is, uh, presumably another presentation software. Um, this is a good question, um, and may, I don't know, uh, maybe Emily, I can respond to this. Okay. Uh, it does not matter. We can, in terms of the technology, pretty much anything that you can put on your computer screen, we can, will, will, is what the audience will see. I would make your choice based on, um, on what you're comfortable with and what you're used to. Um, on the day of a presentation, you don't want to be fooling around with some software that you're not familiar with and um, and not comfortable with. I would recommend um, one of the standard things, um, you know, PowerPoint's kind of the ultimate thing, or if you're an Apple user, Keynote's great. And um, uh, it, I just always be more comfortable with things that are widely used. Um, but ba the basic answer to your question is it's what you're used to, and there are no technical restrictions for anything that you're presenting. Um, a lot of people, uh, I teach a class where the students all give 10 minute presentations, and many of them give it from um, an Adobe Acrobat presenter, which is not a standard presentation software, and it works, it works pretty well. They don't see presenter notes. For example, so that would be another consideration. The, the software like PowerPoint allows you to project the um, just your slide to the audience, but for you to be able to see the notes that you've made, and there's a format for showing the notes underneath the slide that can be an aid as you're presenting. So um, that's not a very specific question, but hopefully that's some information that you can sort through and. Um, and and pick out what you need. Uh, let's see, that was Christine. Is that answer your question, Christine? Oh, yep, you respond in the text, okay. Other questions? All right, well, while you're thinking about additional questions for Dr. Greck, and maybe I can address the, we have now a couple of questions on the difference between a poster presentation and a 10 minute talk. Um, and in, in the most general way of thinking about this, in the sort of the non-virtual meeting world, there's a huge difference between a poster presentation and a 10-minute talk. And um, I think everybody can sort of envision what that is, even if you've never given a poster or a talk. In one case, you're standing up in front of face-to-face -face with people, and you're, you have your data next to you, and you're walking people through in a very manual way through your, your presentation. Um, and the, the visual aspects are totally different because you're standing in front of a printed version of your um, uh, of, of your data, of your presentation. And um, unfortunately, since the since COVID, we've been doing this symposium virtually, and some of the differences between a poster presentation and a 10 minute talk have evaporated a little bit or become blurred because there there is no, virtual equivalent to standing in front of a six by eight poster with all your data on it. So um, the, the poster presentations 
are kind of, we, they've turned out we've done this. This will be our third year to do it like this. And the poster, the poster presentations have been re amazingly effective. The, I, I was very suspicious that that would work in a virtual environment and, uh, and sort of um, overwhelmed by how well it actually did work, where you're making a presentation um, with a, a, usually a smaller number of slides than you would have in a 10 minute talk. And spending a little bit more time on each slide, a little the the amount of time you have for your poster presentation is slightly longer than for a ten minute talk, and you can organize it in any way that you want, um, and it depends on on your um, on your um, uh, area of research, the type of of results you're presenting, your take home message, you know what your methods are. How are the balance between all of those things? Um, the in general, the poster presentations are are um, a little bit less um, sort of um, formulaic than they are when you're standing in front of a poster, where you sort of start with the abstract, you you, you work through the poster in a in a way that you pre-programmed. Um, it is like that with the the virtual version of it, but it's um, it, it's done usually with a smaller number of slides that are more carefully selected and with a little bit more. Uh, how would you how would I describe this? Ongoing interaction. A presentation is a little bit more formal with a, the speaker uh, making the presentation and then questions afterwards. Whereas a poster, we've tried to make it. A little bit more like it would be if you were all standing together within ten feet of each other and you were talking, where there's more back and forth type, um, a, more of a conversation about your research than I, a, a you know a, a presentation and then questions uh, in a in a specific question answer period afterwards. Um, so I hope that gives a little bit more of a picture. Let, let me look at um, some of the questions here and see if there's more specific questions. Um, my research is still ongoing and it's a qualitative project. So my con in my conclusion, I plan to present my findings so far uh, and the ongoing research plan. Does that sound okay? Absolutely. That's, I mean, you're all students or most of you are students and most of you are going to be presenting research that's in progress. And, you know, the whole point of the symposium is for all of us to be exposed to all of the research that's going on here. And, um, and it, it's just as valuable to know how a project is progressing and what the goals are and what you've done so far as it is to hear the the final presentation as if it was your thesis presentation. So that it's absolutely fine. That was uh, Anjali who asked that question and you do not be concerned about that at all. And in fact, use it as, as sort of the theme of your talk. Here's what I've done so far and here's what I'm planning on doing and here's why I think it's important. Uh, so very good question. Thank you for that. So Bedri asked a question, uh, what is the maximum number of slides as a rule of thumb, or does it not matter um, um, as long as the presentation is 10 minutes or less? That's a great question. And um, I'll give my response, and then uh, Dr. Grecken will uh, may have a different response. So this is something in my class where, I, where every student gives a 10-minute presentation that we spend a lot of time on, because many students have a fear of not having a slide in front of them all the time where they can look at and use as as not as a crutch for presenting but as a guide for presenting things and and that that tends to drive many students to try to to have a slide for every thought that they're going to have and met and have many more slides than they need and um that for many most people is a mistake you really want the slides to only present the the essence of what you're talking about and not every word that you're going to say um, so my general uh, rule for maximum slides is one slide per minute and there, there which is a little bit exaggerated and this is a kind of a particular environment where we're presenting data and data slides that are dense are long take a long time to 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 um, present 
other types of, of material that are images that maybe don't take as much time to describe that can be rather flexible. So I, I would, the only thing that I would say about this is, is you need to avoid the idea, the, 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 um, uh, the desire to get as many slides in or as much data in as possible, then not overcrowd things. Uh, Dr. Grecken, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I I would agree with that. Um, you, you want to avoid as much as possible reading off the slides or um, you know overwhelming your audience with slides. And I think the 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 best thing to do is just practice to make a slideshow and find someone that isn't super familiar with your research and 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 give it to them and and um, make sure it's smooth. Make sure you can give the presentation while you're looking them in the eye instead of at your at your slides and and kind of see see how it goes. One of the one of the um, I, I guess you call it a good thing that happened in the, the COVID epidemic where we all got used to using this this kind of software and presenting uh, virtually is that it at least for me it became much easier to practice talks because you're basically the practice talk is identical to the talk you're giving you're still sitting in front of your computer you don't have the weirdness of you practice the talk a bunch of times in your office. And then you you step up to the podium and everything feels different and and not quite the same and there's people right in front of you that just does, uh, it, it's it's not completely a good thing there's some bad aspects to this but it's it does make it a little bit more uniform you're practicing it versus um, the actual presentation they're much more similar so I think that's an advantage and I would also emphasize what what Dr. Grecken mentioned. Uh, for bullet point slides, text slides, very definitely avoid the temptation to put everything, to, to, to write out everything that you want to say on the slide. Try to make it more of bullet points on the slide that you expand on verbally, and it makes it easier for the audience, and it avoids the, the terrible trap of actually reading a slide to your audience, which you want to avoid as much as possible. Um, let's see, we now have several more questions here. Let me see if I've picked up every maximum number of slides. Does the poster presentation have to be a one page slide? No, um, one of the things that you do, do not do is take a four by six poster, make a single slide out of it and put it up. It's, it doesn't work, it doesn't work well. Divide it into sections, pick out the key components and presented in three or, or four separate slides. There's flexibility there, um, but but this is a, a should be viewed as a different beast than making a printed poster and presenting that. What do you recommend for qualitative art students? I created a somatic movement study poster or presentation. Okay, Christine, that's an excellent question. And I, I don't know enough about your um, uh, uh, about your 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 subject matter to really give you an informed answer for that. Um, and in the case of what we're talking about here, where the posters are virtual and the presentations virtual, I think you could probably make almost anything work in either of those contexts. Um, if you want, um, if you would show up, uh, come to the um, the practice session for the poster or um, uh, our presentation session, we could actually look at, uh, um, I'll, I'll be present of both of those, and we could actually look at your material, and maybe I could give you some more concrete advice. Um, let's see. Anyone that hasn't presented before, this is such a great opportunity. My favorite part of last year's presentation was the Q&A and feedback because it helped me polish my final project. Thank you, Fatuma. That's great. Uh, I, I'm glad you had a good experience, and I would agree completely. I, um, you know, we, we sort of lived in dread of having to do this symposium virtually, and it turned into something exactly the opposite of what we were worried about. And 
I think lots of people got lots of feedback in both poster sessions and presentations that, that helped them a lot. Um, Sonia asked on WOVA, that's our platform, um, will multiple people be presenting their posters at the same time um, in some different uh, similar breakout rooms? We haven't fully established the exact protocol for that, but there will likely be multiple breakout rooms or something equivalent and people will be jumping around from one room to another and um it's it's done partially to mimic what it's like in a real poster session where there's people wandering around and you know stepping up to your poster and listening to you talk to somebody else and then moving away and um and it, it has worked like that um the poster sessions people tend to move around quite a bit we do ask the poster present presenters to plan on a 15 minute presentation that they can give four times. Um, my experience from the last few of these is that that frequently breaks down and it becomes much more of a conversation, which is a little less planned and maybe you can't get everything across that you wanted to, but works very well in terms of the type of interaction that you like, would like to have at a, at a meeting when you're all milling around in the same room. Um, so Sonia, I hope that answered your question. Come to the practice session uh, for some more information there. Robert uh, says, my research is not necessarily qualitative or quantitative, but more so about how to make use of the material developed, oral history interviews. I feel it's more exploratory rather than presenting results. Is this okay? Yes, that is okay. Absolutely. Whatever your research project is, the point of the symposium is to tell people about it and, and display your enthusiasm for what you're doing and, and educate them on why what you're doing is important. It really doesn't matter what it is. I hope that answers your question, Robert. I'm looking forward to, to, um, to, to um, actually seeing what you have to say or hearing what you have to say. Will the poster also be for 10 minutes? That's Solomon. It will be, I believe it's slated for 12 minutes. For, for you know, the poster goes for one hour, you're there. And um, and uh, this is related to the, uh, my response to an earlier question. The posters tend to, to evolve frequently into more of conversations about things, but you should plan for a, a 10 to 15 minute presentation where if nobody's asking any questions, you can get through all your material and get your, your main points across in that length of time. What are the specific differences should be? The, um, what specific difference should the poster be from a talk? I think we've, we've, we've touched on that. Um, that's Solomon. If you have additional questions, feel free to email me afterwards about the poster, the presentation. Okay. Will the posters be virtual? Yes, the posters are. Everything's virtual. Next year, we are going to do a, at least a mixture, but this year, everything is virtual. Um, one of the reasons it's not mixed is because we haven't figured out a good way to do that yet. And it, it, from all of our experiences in lecture, lecture hall, where we're trying to do a mixed thing, where there's some people online and some people uh, in person it has not, in my experience for sure, has not been very satisfying. And so um, we're waiting for um, some insight into how to do that properly. Well, thank you, Reagan. That's very nice of you to say. Reagan, I like the presentation. Emily? Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other questions um, and we're out of time. Um, so you will be able to see this presentation, the recording of this presentation tomorrow. Um, we will be sending out um, information, more information to speakers and post presenters and speakers tomorrow. So look for that. And as usual, feel free to email any of us on these, the symposium committee if you have questions. And I'm sure Dr. Grecklin would be um, would be happy to answer questions. Um, if you have additional questions, you can contact her. Absolutely. Good luck, everybody. And thanks so much for coming today. Good luck. Bye-bye. We'll see you all soon.